Put both your hands on your head and say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Amen. I said hands, not feet. <laughs> All right, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 7. I got about 40 minutes to work through this, and I'm sure I can. For God did not give us the spirit of timidity, but the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. King James Version says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. The, uh, I like the English Standard Version says, For God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Uh, the International Standard Version is particularly nice. Uh, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and of discipline. And then the God, God's Word translation, uh, 95 edition says, God didn't give us a cowardly spirit, but a spirit of power, love, and of good judgment. And of good judgment. Of good judgment. Father, I pray today that you help us. I pray for your blessing. And I pray for your anointing. In the name of Jesus, amen. I talk to you on the subject uh, from the series, No Fear. Uh, scripture says in Romans chapter number 8 and verse 15, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. It is neither God's will nor is it God's intention for us to function or have fear. And uh, I'm not going to try to be uh, Dr. Phil here this evening and uh, do a psychoanalysis on fear, but I, I want to bring out a couple of very important factors here uh, concerning fear. I want to go to Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14, verse 22. I'll preach from the King James just a little. Immediately Jesus said to his disciples, go on ahead to the other side. And this is interesting because he stayed behind to dismiss the crowd. And this is a different uh, setting here, you know. Normally when you have somebody that's such a high profile, you want the ushers to get rid of the crowd. And, uh, but he stays to dismiss the crowd. He's shaking a few hands, greeting a number of people. It was a massive crowd because the few verses before that, he had just fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And so he sends these guys away uh, and he stays there dismissing this massive crowd. And as he's dismissing the crowd and they don't want to leave because it's a glorious day, phenomenal things are happening. Uh, he dismissed them, verse 23, and went up into the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. So there's an implication here that when he went up to the mountainside to pray, a few folks went with him. But as the night began to thin out, and, and as the night began to get uh, deeper into the night, the crowd thinned out, and people started to go home to legitimate functions, and he's, he's left there alone. And the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by waves, because the wind was against it. The wind was against it. They had, it was kind of like flying uh, uh, into the jet stream. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. He was walking on the water. Everyone say, walking on the water. Walking on the water. Not water, water. Say water. water. <laughs> <sighs> I thought, Americans, man, it's water. It's walking on the water. <laughs> and shortly before the dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. And, and the, this is amazing here. The, these are not slouch boys. These are tough guys. They were terrified and said it's a ghost, which is an interesting position of what people do believe. And uh, they cried out in fear. They cried out in fear. When you have a man's man crying in fear, a man's I'm not a man's man. I'm just a little man. I'll explain that in a minute. And these guys were full of fear, and immediately, Jesus, but immediately, 
Jesus said to them, because he tracked the level of fear they were in. He said, take good courage, don't be afraid. That's powerful right there. And of course, uh, he said, be of good cheer, etc. And then Peter said, you know, if that's you, let me come on the water. And he jumps out and he walks towards Jesus. And he saw the wind boisterous and he was afraid, verse 30, and beginning to sink, he said, save me, Lord. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. Say, stretched out his hand. And he said, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? Father, please help me again today. Four quick things. There are four quick things. Firstly, fear is, fear is a spirit. Say that. Fear is a Say it like it's Friday night and you've got nowhere to go. Fear is a power. Fear is an emotion. Fear is an action. Now, there's healthy fear. There's healthy fear. Good fear is Proverbs 1 verse 7. And Psalm 9 verse 10. And Psalm 111 verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Holy One is an understanding of wisdom. And so when you have fear, that word there is respect. And one of the challenges that I think we do have in, in Pentecostal charismaticism, we have a lack of fear for God, respect. And that's because of the kind of church we have. Uh, in traditional churches, that's Orthodox churches, people are not frivolous when they walk into a holy building. They don't talk, there's obeisance, there's respect, there's honor, because the building itself, the, the ambience that's set by the building itself has a sense of an aura, and people come in reverently. In our churches, it's like we walk in, what's up, what's up, yeah, baby, what's going on, dog, and uh, you know. <laughs> and I like that informality because it assists in our style of worship but it tends to place God in a place where people don't respect and don't fear. And so people can do stuff out there, really, really misbehave and walk in here with no respect and no fear and no aura that the creator's here. And as a result of that, sometimes people can commit heinous sins and walk into an environment that's very light and very frivolous and, and, and walk out without conviction will we'll have done something totally heinous and will walk out without conviction. We're dealing with a situation where a certain man, a uh, married man, had uh, an affair with a girl in the church and she got pregnant and then took the girl and had an abortion and came to church and made like nothing was wrong because the man of God didn't pick it up. And that's because there's no fear or respect for the Lord. Say after me, I fear the Lord. See, it's, it's reverence. It's like in the old days, daddy had his own chair. Amen. And he had his own cup. You don't drink out of that cup or his beer mug. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I, I had to take a sip out of that beer mug when I was small. But you don't drink out of that cup and you don't sit in that chair. And if the pliers is on the television, you don't turn that thing. <laughs> ah, old school people here. <laughs> because you knew that was daddy's cup, daddy's plate, so on and so forth. Are we together? So that fear is important. It's healthy. It's respect. It's reverence. It needs to come back. It needs to come back. There needs to be a holy, a holy fear for the things of God. And as a praise and worship leader, those are some of the things that need to be cultivated, where there needs to be this holy hush that comes across the place and the tongues and interpretation with, with pure sincerity flows through and, and people know that surely the Lord has been in this place. Yeah. Someone shout fear. fear. Say that again. Fear. All right. Come on, Judah. Come on, come on. And then from natural, there's, then there's natural fear. Na natural fear is, uh, you know, 
You fear getting your driver's license. I thought Abigail was driving. She just told me she's 12. I couldn't believe it, you know. But, but when the child in this country turns 16, uh, they become a different species, and you find them on our roads. <laughs> But when you're writing an examination, there's fear to do the exam. That's natural fear. You know, there's, in terms of natural fear, you can uh, fear. <sighs> fear exams, you can fear an event. That's performance fear. Before you run 100 meters, before you stand up to speak to people like this, there's a fear. It's, it's natural fear. And, and it's not unhealthy. In fact, if you don't have that kind of fear, uh, it's very dangerous because then one can become arrogant or cocky or whatever the case might be. But it's good to have that kind of fear. Everyone say natural fear. Natural fear. Say that again. Natural fear. Uh, in terms of natural fear, there's certain things that I think you should fear that uh, sometimes people don't fear. Uh, you know, I was awakened yesterday in Amsterdam. I just dozed off to sleep and uh, I heard this drill sound. And immediately, I was afraid because the drill reminded me of when I was sitting in the dentist chair and he was trying to drill through my mouth to the other part of the world. <laughs> and so, in natural fear, sometimes we fear the policeman. When I was growing up and just misbehaving, my mother would say, if you don't behave, I'm going to call the policeman. So we have natural fear for police. And you're not supposed to because they are supposed to protect. <laughs> supposed to. <laughs> and isn't it amazing you can drive behind somebody that's doing the speed limit and the police cars show up and they slow down immediately? <laughs> Especially the women. Because of fear. These women want to get Kunta Kinte on me here. <laughs> and then in natural fear, you know, sometimes people fear dogs. I have this uh, dognophobia. So every time I listen to Snoop, I get afraid, you know. <laughs> but there's a, <laughs> there's a fear for, for dogs and frogs and bugs, I'm afraid of geckos. And there's a lot of those at the house, just these little lizards. I was in the shower the other day, and a gecko fell from the grass roof onto in the shower. It was about that size. And I was screaming like a girl. Chi-chi, <laughs> save me! <laughs> you think you got the best wife in the world? I got the best wife. She says, oh, baby, oh, baby, I'll come save you. Yo, Chi-Chi came take the little gecko out there. And I was, I was back to my happy place. <laughs> I don't like snakes. I don't like geckos and so on. I married Chi-Chi for this reason. I need somebody to protect me. <laughs> if you think that I opened the door to let Chi-Chi through because I have manners, you got to be kidding. She's going first. That's my ninja. Talk to me about manners. You go first and fight that thing. <laughs> you know, Chi Chi, she's about this tall. I, I'll talk about that in a minute. I used to be a, a little afraid because of the boarding school I went to. I went to a school where they told me the first day I got there, they said, now, they, they call you by your last name in that school. And, and they, they can never say it right. It's Bismarck. And they'd say that there's a nun that walks down the, at midnight, there's a nun that walks down the corridors. Her head is under her shoulders, under her arm, and blood shoots out of her neck. And she's looking for her next victim. And because you're new, she's coming for you. And all my early years, I was afraid, just terrified. And so when I got married, I'm still afraid of the dark. If I hear something outside, I'm saying, Chi Chi, go and see what's there. I didn't marry you for nothing. You go see what's there. <laughs> and Chi-Chi will go with a stick. Who's there? <laughs> I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Everyone say fear. fear. I'm going to touch everybody in, at some point in this man. I'm going to touch everybody. Everyone say fear. fear. Say that again. Fear. I was running one, after one, one morning, early morning, a few months ago, uh, during our summer months, and uh, ah, it was about four in the morning. I started running, started getting light, and I kid you not, just as I came towards like the five kilometer peg, there was a massive green mamba coming across the road. And so I didn't know a white boy could jump so high. <laughs> I, I mean, Gigi tells me I'm white because I can't dance. But anyway, <laughs> I jumped so high, but there were three guys walking this way that thought that my jump was abnormal and they started laughing. <laughs> Until they saw my white face and the snake doing this. And those three black guys instantly turn white. <laughs> and we had three white guys, four white guys running down the street. Everyone say fear. fear. Say fear. fear. Now, as a pastor, there are people that fear me. I didn't know that. I only learned that late. I wish I'd known that earlier. <laughs> but as a pastor, there's people that fear me because of some of the things that allegedly I can do or say. And I found that one of the greatest punishments that I could give somebody, not just uh, members of our church, but, but especially our children, one of, the, one of the things I could say to them, I said, I'm going to go and pray for you. <laughs> they would rather have me whoop them. If I'd say to Dreen or Jason, I'm going to go and pray for you. I'm going to go and pray for you. <laughs> oh, please beat me, Dad, beat me. Everyone say fear. fear. Say fear again. Fear. And then there are things that we fear. In terms of, of, of we, we, we fear the darkness or we fear animals, we fear objects and, and uh, we, we fear uh, scenarios. My greatest fear has always been Chi Chi dying. That's my greatest fear. And uh, from when we got married, I said, if Chi Chi ever died, after that funeral, I'm leaving Zimbabwe, and I'm going to go and live somewhere else. And that's kind of like still in my mind, you know. It's my greatest fear. And fear sometimes can produce all kinds of things. Now, let's talk about natural fear here. What natural fear does, if you come across a snake or you chased by a dog, what happens is that uh, in the amygdala of your brain, there is a stimulus that is released that causes adrenaline to jump to your legs and into your hands for fight and flight. In my case, for flight. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when this happens, your heart rate pops up, your blood pressure's increased, your muscles tighten, and, and you suddenly feel like, David, I can run through a troop and jump over a wall. And you're surprised as to how high you can jump when a situation like that comes. Now, in natural fear, sometimes we can actually create natural fear. Uh, I do not watch horror movies. I just, I don't have, I don't have the sense or the one to the desire to watch horror movies. But in, in the very few that I've just breezed through, it's only white people starring in white, in well, horror movies. <laughs> you don't see black folks in horror movies. All right, name me one. <laughs> Freddy Krueger. Jaws. Is that a scary movie? Jason. Chucky. <laughs> Halloween 350. <laughs> we got movies like Big Mama 3. <laughs> Hello. I don't even watch a shaving commercial just in case the brother's gonna cut himself. <laughs> because sometimes fear can present, pre present this thrill. And many times when people have this kind of fear going on, they're sitting on the edge and it, it helps them burn. But what happens is that when a person is, is engaged 
in active fear in their life. It then becomes a culture and a lifestyle and it's going to inhibit and prohibit you from taking certain steps. Now, watch this. Alongside fears, there's what is called phobias. I'm going somewhere. There are phobias. Uh, the most common of these or popular of these is claustrophobia. And I didn't know that I was somewhat claustrophobic. Uh, I learned this flying in on a plane uh, last year, flying into Johannesburg. I was seated in the center aisle. And the person on the left-hand side had all the shutters closed. And I was open the shutters, oh, I was pressing that button, open the shutters, open the shutters, open the shutters. I'm gonna throw a gecko on you, open the shutters. <laughs> and I had no idea I was claustrophobic, and there are many, many phobias. And it's a fear of some natural things. Arachnophobia is a fear of spiders. Photophobia is afraid of sensitive light or photographs. Hemophobia is of, uh, you're afraid of blood. Testophobia is afraid of exams. Uh, I think everybody starts from that. And so all these phobias come on us, it's, it's a phobic. And once we're afraid of these things, then it, it forms all part of somewhat of some natural. But let's talk about abnormal fear and then I'm done. Abnormal fear. Abnormal fear is a type of thing that jumps on you that attacks or belittles your faith. It attacks your faith and belittles your competence. And this is called the spirit of fear. It's a demonic thing. You know, it's a demonic thing. And it'll sit on you. And it comes in the most unexpected way. Now, uh, in the middle of the night, if uh, there's a noise outside and I'm sending Chi Chi out, <laughs> ah, that's a different kind of fear. But in the middle of the night, if I can smell a devil coming in, then something happens all over me and I start getting all... All right. <laughs> I feel the power. Now, unnatural fear or demonic fear, it's called the spirit of fear. It'll find you where you are. You can be doing so well, and suddenly this thing will jump on you. Everybody say no fear. Come on, Judah. No say no fear. no fear. Now, when you have this kind of fear come upon your life, you're going to find in Matthew chapter number 14 all levels of this fear. The first one in Matthew 14, they come to a place where there's thousands of people and they don't have food. So there's one level of fear because of their competence level. They have no food. And then in the distribution of the food, there's another level of fear because they feel that they're not competent to distribute all this food. Now they have to pick up all the fragments that are left over. There's 12 baskets left over. And now it seems like there's a punishment given to them for some reason and Jesus said, I'll send the crowd away you guys get in the boat and go. Now, these are strong men. And so they're out there and they, they, they're facing their worst nightmare because the wind is contrary. The wind is hitting the nose of that plane as they're trying to go across. The waves are antagonistic towards them. And these are men's men. These are strong men. And they're facing now this tremendous ability of using their skill and their wit to override their fear. Now, everything you go through in life is going to be a faith or a fear factor. Now, I'm not going to go eat, you know, uh, I'm not going to go eat bugs and chew spiders and, and do that fear factor stuff and sleep with uh, a, a bunch of anacondas and, you know, get into a pool with uh, piranhas and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm not spending, uh, you know, a night with a bunch of leeches sucking because there's nothing much to suck out of me anyway. Uh, <laughs> But one, one thing I am going to do, I am going to start dealing with demonic fears that have caused me to be incompetent in certain areas in my life. The devil is a liar. And that's what I'm coming for tonight. That's what I'm coming for tonight. That's where I'm going tonight because we want to break some things on some people over here. Amen. Give me a few minutes and we're going to get there. Now, now when, you, when you're rowing against the tide and you're rowing against some things and you know that this is ominous, this doesn't look good, you are facing your greatest fear. And when you begin to face your greatest fear, it's year now that your faith is going to have to kick in. Now, Jesus knows what he's doing. He's getting the people away, and he's going up into a mountain to pray, which he does. And while he's up in the mountain praying, these guys are rowing against the wind. And you can actually tell when you're dealing with something that's contrary, because suddenly everything's against you. Everything is facing you in your face. Your money's not doing good. Your life's not doing good. 
It seems like the ministry is in the night season. It seems like your business is slacking down. It seems like your hair is falling out and uh, all of those crazy things happening in your life because the wind is contrary and the wind is pressing up against you. And then you've got to use your energy resource to get across. And everybody in the boat has got to do their part. Everyone in the house has got to roll their part. But what's rising there is not faith. What's rising there is fear. And, and you, you start remembering what happened to your colleagues in similar situations, how so-and-so drowned or so-and-so lost their boat, and, and how uh, something happened centuries ago, how your grandfather lost his life. All of those fears begin to rise up in your spirit, and, and generational fear begins to rise up, and so-and-so died of cancer, and so-and-so had prostate cancer, and somebody else, you know, was killed in an accident. Suddenly you get to a certain age group and you begin to realize that relatives that were in your age group, where you are now, started dying off. And this, you're rowing against the tide. Every 10 years, a different voice speaks to you. And every 10 years, that voice comes with it another level of fear to drive you into a level of incompetence and insignificance. But for somebody in this room, God's gonna lift some fear supernaturally off your life. Oh yeah, shut up devil, we're coming for you. We're coming right where you are. We're going to remove that fear because you should be a lot further in your life than where you are right now. You should be a lot further down the road than you are right now. Fear is, a, they, they are trigger mechanisms to fear. Trigger, it, it, it's just a trigger. And what happens is you can be doing just so fine and suddenly, boom, a trigger mechanism and this thing jumps on you. It's called a familiar spirit. You can be doing just so well, you can be coming to the very acme of your life, the zenith of, of achieving something, and suddenly your greatest fear jumps right in you. Just before you get your breakthrough, when you would do good, evil is present right there. And suddenly you're in a freeze mode. Suddenly your belly turns to jowl because the adrenaline can't pump either way. You're stuck in the middle with nowhere to go. You just feel like you were bricking the wall. There's nothing you can do. There's no one around to help you. Jesus is up there doing Jesus stuff. Other guys over here are fighting for their life and here you are stuck in the middle with zero. And all of your childhood years come racing back. The years when you were molested come racing back. The areas of your greatest failures come racing back. And here they are, you're sitting in a place called nowhere, nowhere to go, no place to turn. Everywhere you go, the door is closed. And the spirit, it's a demon, it comes and jumps all over you and starts regurgitating the filth from its sulfuric belly into your spirit. I've seen great people backslide because of fear. I've seen marriages break up because of fear. I've seen people choke because of fear. So that kid that won the US Open the other day, he could have won in Augusta, but that last few holes, he choked because of fear. Fear will jump on you. Fear will, will inhibit your, your performance. And so, so the reason you confess the word, the reason you confess the word, it's like muscle memory. It's like muscle memory, your muscles remember. That's why uh, big German, Dirk. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Steve, amen. We just have to rub you just a little, amen. That's why he was shooting so many, okay? Because you can do it with your eyes closed because your muscles remember. Your muscles remember. And so Jesus is putting them in the middle of their greatest fear because he wants to, them to remember what happened that day. It's, it's, it's like muscle memory. When you're doing that swing on the golf course, it's muscle memory. There's memory steel. They can construct steel and electric, put electric impulses on the steel and at a certain level, they can bend that steel and move it in an opposite direction for five miles to suck oil out of a pond in somebody else's ranch. And that steel is called memory steel. And so anytime you are facing fear, it's God is wanting you to remember what just happened in your life. Tell someone, remember, 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 if God did it for you there, he'll do it for you here. If God raised you there, he'll raise you here. If God did it for Stephen, you know he's gonna do it for Amy. And, and the reason God's doing it, the, the reason the devil's doing it is because you're about to hit a breakthrough. And even though it seems obvious, but when you're going through it, it creates all kinds of fear. Isn't that right, Bev? Isn't that right? All kinds of fear. And, and so, ignorance sometimes can produce fear. Now let me show you what I mean, I'm nearly there. 
You see what I mean? My cousin Wesley Brunt, at the age of 15, had his leg amputated right here, right here, because of cancer. And uh, I hadn't seen Wesley we, for years, and nobody told us that Wesley had cancer. No one told us he lost his leg. And so when we went to go and visit them, uh, our family, and uh, Wesley was one of my favorite cousins, and suddenly he comes out of, out of the house with no leg and crutches. And it freaked us out. I mean, I was like totally freaked out. And they told me this is what cancer did to Wesley. We didn't know what caused cancer, didn't know what cancer was. And so about three years later, I'm busy running somewhere and, and I got a pain right here, right here. I got a pain in the butt right here. <laughs> and, and I was, I'm dying of cancer. <laughs> I'm gonna lose my leg and a little bit more. I'm going to lose my leg. And so this went on for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. And I was convinced, I was convinced I had cancer. Until I went to the hospital to see the nun. And she said to me, ah, it's just your glutamus gland. Just your glutamus. I didn't even know a glutamus had a gland. <laughs> because ignorance will cause fear in your life. I come against the spirit of fear here tonight. I come against the spirit of fear here tonight. Your ignorance will not kill you. I come against the spirit of fear. That devil is lying to you. Now watch as I come to my close. I'm nearly done because we want to pray for a bunch of people. I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. If you look at Hercules in his, in the way he deals with uh, 12 different levels of elevation in the, the myth of Hercules. There are 12 different things that Hercules has to do to get to the status of gods. This is just a story in Greek mythology. A modern new age, it's just Greek mythology. After he kills uh, the lion, he's gonna go now for the hydra. And, and what Hercules is actually overcoming, he's overcoming human fear because a greater, worse enemy keeps on appearing. And, and he gets to the point where nothing is gonna shock him anymore. Nothing's gonna drive him back anymore. Nothing's gonna push him down because he's overcoming his fear. It's not the matter of dealing with an opponent, it's a matter of fear. Because the fears that you have in your life can inhibit you possessing the promised land. It's like David was singing about the walls. Those boys that went into the promised land, the 10 of them had a trigger mechanism. When they saw the walls, what triggered in their, in their life was slavery. They were building walls bigger and better than these. And they were being triggered into dealing with uh, slave owners beating the hell out of them, beating their life to an inch. They were dealing with slave owners that were ostracizing them. And so when they faced these walls, suddenly, suddenly, fear is triggered. And their legs become like lead weights. They can't move. Instead of having faith to say, we believe the promise, the walls are evident. Because they haven't put any building blocks of faith in their spirit. The walls are evident. So when Paul writes to Timothy now, and as Jesus is dealing with these boys in the boat, they are both dealing with the spirit of fear. Timothy is dealing with the spirit of fear. He knows he's going to be a great ministry. He knows he's going to be Paul's successor. He understands the implication of what God requires for him in his life. But because he's in the middle, he's Jew and Gentile. He's not sure whether he's accepted or not accepted. Paul says, don't let anybody despise your youth. So he's really struggling with who he is. But not only is he struggling with who he is, he's dealing with the very facetious, ferocious, vicious Roman Empire that are killing preachers and putting them in lion's dens and putting them in front of gladiators. And so as a young apostle, he's got this great responsibility. He doesn't want to fail, but he's also got this tremendous fear because of the system. A demonic spirit has been unleashed in, in the world and he's got this tremendous fear. And his daddy comes to him and says, now son, God has not given you the spirit of fear. You are not to fear. You are not to have any fear. We are going to believe God for the greatest thing that you've ever seen happen in your life. We're going to believe God that this season is going to be the greatest season you've ever had. We're going to believe God that what's been holding you back won't hold you back. Even if you fail, it really doesn't matter. God will always be there to pick up the pieces because who's measuring failure anyway? So don't be afraid if you're not married at 30. Don't be afraid if you're not married at 40. Don't be afraid if you're not married because I've seen 40 years who are afraid that they are. Don't be afraid if you don't have kids. 
Don't be afraid if you don't have your business by this time. Don't be afraid because that devil will capitalize on fear. It's a spirit of fear. He'll wake you up at night and make you dream you're having a heart attack and all you did was add too much pizza. I'm telling you, the devil is a liar. There's nothing wrong with your chest. There's nothing wrong with your lungs. Your kidneys are fine. Yeah, baby. The devil, the spirit of cancer is not sitting on this church. That's a lying devil. Devil, shut up and get out of here. You lying spirit. How dare you invade our space? How dare you come into this place and invade our space? Nobody's dying. No one's, no one, no one is dying. We come against every accusation. We come against, you know, there's people out there that are so facetious, they'll start saying stuff like, oh, it's a curse, it's God this and God's judging this and that. Shut up, devil. We bind your accusation, we bind your mouth. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Devil, I want you to know I'm not dealing with a gecko, I'm dealing with the real devil. And I've got power against evil spirits. I've got power against your mind and your mouth. I bind you and shut you up. Devil, because of what you've done, we are going to double for our trouble. Our money's gonna increase. Oh, I feel like preaching up in here. Something's about to break forth in the heavens. Fear's being lifted off. Yes, you will have that baby. I know you lost one, but you'll have that baby. And your baby will be stronger and better and bigger and stronger. Yeah, that song got away, but God's gonna give you another song. You'll preach another message. You'll write another book. You'll go to another level. That fear is lifting off your life. When the devil makes you afraid at night, get up and say, what? 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 Bring it on, Cletus. Bring it. Bring. Bring. For the next seven days, if a devil's given you grief going down the tollway, find the first exit. Pull up on the side of the road and say, what? What? What have you got? Bring now. I feel a... a no fear. I want you to tell three people. No fear. In this season. No fear. In this season. I'm not backing up in the season. I feel the power of God in the season. I have the blood. Satan, the blood is against you. I've got the name. Goliath, the name is against you. Take the name of Jesus with you. In the season, I've got the word of God. It's quick and sharp, and it's powerful. Give three people a high five and say no fear, no fear. I'm not scared of no popo, no fear, no fear. I feel like going to another level. You mess with me, devil. I'll have twins next year. No fear, no fear of starvation. I'm not losing that building. I'm not losing my house. I'm not losing my job. I'm not losing my mind. No fear. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost coming over me. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love of stability shout no fear look three women in the eye and say no fear baby no fear no fear don't be afraid I said, don't be afraid of what people may say because they'll say it anyway. They'll say stuff when you're driving. They'll say stuff when you're not driving. They'll say stuff when you're using soap. You know they're gonna say stuff when you don't use soap. 
They say stuff when you got hair. They say stuff when you don't got hair. They say stuff when you're married. They say stuff when you're not married. They'll talk about your kids. They'll talk about your travel. The devil is a liar. I've made up my mind. If it's in my spirit to do it, I'm gonna do it. Press down, shaken together. Devil, if you've had trouble with me up until this point, I'm switching the fear factor. I have faith that will move mountains. I say to that mountain, be thou removed. I have faith to curse that tree. Curse it in the roots. Uh, devil, you better fear me now. At night, you better run from me. This is a different Tudor Bismarck now. Yeah, baby. Send the devil. I'm ready. No fear. No fear. I want you to shout seven times loud. No fear. No fear. No fear. No fear. No fear. I feel something pushing up here. Start taking it off your head. Start pulling it off your life. Rebuke that curse and that devil. I'm not going back to fear. My marriage will not fail. We're gonna work this thing out. We're gonna talk it through. I gotta feel like somebody here needs to get fear off your life. Everybody standing. My personal view, my personal view that Jesus was dealing with Peter's fear because two chapters later, he's going to give this man the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but he couldn't get them because he had fear and here's his fear, here's Peter's fear. It was Peter and Andrew, but they had another brother that the sea had taken. Another brother at the sea had taken. And he said, it's a ghost. And they thought that that was the ghost of his brother that was killed in a similar sea accident. And he said, Lord, if that's you, this better not be a ghost of the past. If that's you, let me come. Jesus, come on. What killed your brother won't kill you. Get out that boat. Watch. He's walking now towards Jesus, overcoming his fear, knowing that his brother was killed. And when he began to sink, when he saw the waves... Here comes the trigger mechanism. Here comes the trigger mechanism. And he starts to sink. His greatest fear. The Bible says Jesus stretched forth his hand. Now, I don't think Jesus was standing that close to stretch forth his hand. I believe his hand went as long as it could be. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, Bishop. Because earlier that day, Jesus took five loaves and stretched it. <laughs> stretched that bread to feed 5,000 men. And Peter was way out there. And Jesus just stretched forth his hand. The Bible says, is the, hand, is the Lord's hand short? He just stretched forth his hand. Here comes that hand to overcome Peter's greatest fear. I don't care how far you are. His hand is stretching right in your business, right there, right there. He's stretching your daughter. He's stretching to your daughter in prison right now. He's stretching to your son, Skid Row. His hand is stretching. I want you to raise your hands. Wow. 
For you are great, you do miracles so great. Can we do that twice? It's too low for me. Take it. You deserve the glory and the honor. We lift our hands in worship. You deserve the glory. Come on, sing it from here. We glory your holy for you are great for you are great there is no one else full snare your hands on a neighbor I know our time is done put your hands on a neighbor put your hands on a neighbor and rebuke the spirit of fear I come against fear I come against fear I come against fear I will not fear I will not take be taken to bondage I will not fear that sea may have taken my brother but it's not taking me that sickness may have taken my sister it's not taking me yeah 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 that road has taken somebody it's not taking me the system has taken someone's house. It's not taking mine. No fear. I will not die. I will not. No fear. No fear. No fear. There's something moving. No fear. For you. 